So questions or comments? Uh, I see a and appearing here, but uh, not sure who who that is. Yes, uh, Arnaud Pelletier. Uh. Oh, Arnaud. Okay. Arnaud. Yeah, um, so good morning, everyone. That was wonderful, uh, Marosa. And I've got a um, kind of very gener general question. Um, so what does it mean to add a limit? So I, I I understand. So I'm I'm really convinced that you make the point with um, what you call the Neoplatonic frame. I'm I'm not so sure I will go so far, but I think it's so that th there is more fundamental beings um, in reference to which more derivative beings can be defined. That's absolutely for me um, a given. But then when you say, and that's really interesting that Lamy in, insists on this expression to add a limit. So that's not a pure negation. There is something that is added and that would be missing in pure activity or pure positivity. And perhaps um, can you say something more about the relation be between adding a limit and having a body? Uh, OK. Um, the way, th thank you, another great question. Uh, um, the way I interpret this adding a limit is uh, adding a determination. That is, uh, you start uh, from uh, the absolute, uh, the one uh, which is uh, beyond uh, all determination. So there is uh, all the richness of, uh, of being, uh, but is uh, beyond all determination. That is to say, uh, you cannot say that formally that in the one uh, there is uh, say me there is a uh, you there is a uh, um, this pen there is a uh, this these are all uh, determination so in uh, in in god uh, there is uh, all the perfection uh, all the reality of everything insofar as i have a bit of reality in this pen well for for Leibniz is not the best example but uh, other uh, individual substances have some bits of reality insofar as they have a reality that reality needs to be in god if in god there is the reality of everything however what you cannot have in god is to have formally this is maria rosa and not arnaud pelletier that is why the um, the one is ineffable because at the moment in which, uh, what do you do with the language? With language, uh, you start uh, determining, uh, you start to say, what is this? Uh, and uh, uh, by saying, what is this? Uh, you are also saying that it is not that other things. So I uh, read uh, uh, these adding limits uh, as uh, adding a uh, determination, because in other tests, Leibniz says, uh, that uh, a determination uh, is a sort of limit. And uh, uh, Hegel and Spinoza use uh, specifically this term, um, omnis determinatio est negatio. So I think uh, this is uh, the, the, the way of thinking, that uh, limiting uh, is uh, determining. So you add uh, something, uh, but by adding something, it's like uh, I, yesterday I was using the day or the day before I was using the very crude uh, example of, uh, as it were, uh, um, taking a bucket uh, and uh, scooping out uh, a, a bit of uh, from uh, the sea. To scoop out a bit of the sea, uh, you you need. Uh, something you need uh, this form uh, this shape uh, this bucket uh, that is your determination but the problem with determination is that uh, they introduce uh, negation so that is uh, how i interpret that and it seems to me that uh, that is a very uh, neoplatonic uh, way of thinking when when i say neoplatonic i really don't uh, uh, mean that uh, i am looking for specific sources uh, 
well, in, um, Plotinus says that in the Aeneas, and here is uh, Leibniz reading the Aeneas in uh, 1676. So, or, or, I am really talking about uh, metaphysical models uh, rather than uh, talking about sources. And uh, it, it seems to me that uh, that is uh, a model of explanation, uh, which is one uh, of the an handful of fundamental metaphysical alternatives. Uh, Leibniz could have uh, used another model. Uh, he has uh, chosen to use this one. Uh, and uh, that is how I read uh, uh, limits as uh, additions. Uh, regarding uh, um, limits and bodies, uh, to be honest, I don't know. I haven't thought uh, uh, specifically about that. So do you see uh, a, a connection there? Um, uh, yes, I, I would say yes, because I so I absolutely agree with everything you say. And then but I have always this I'm struggling with this thing is that um, how does determination happen without being in place of God? But you, you've just said it. You need something which determinates, which needs something which makes the limit a something. And then I would say that one possible um, reading would be that exactly that this um considering the link to bodies uh, whether it, it is a possible bodies in god's mind or real actual bodies in the universe could be a way to understand to understand that having a limit has something to to do with having a body so to speak uh, that, that that would be my mm. a possible reading so I'm struggling with just this uh, expression. What is so? How how to bring about a determination? You need so you know you take your your C, but you need a bucket. You need the bucket to determine an, an amount of water. So you need a something uh, through which by which um, determination happens. That's my that's just my concern. Yeah yeah yeah. Now I see I see that. I would say. To continue with my crude analogy, the buckets are in God's intellect. These are the the, the concepts, if you if you like. They are the thoughts, the th the thoughts of God, uh, which are uh, uh, thinking, uh, determinate uh, individual essences, uh, indeed uh, uh, fully determined uh, to to the to the. Uh, <laughs> To, to, to really all uh, infinitely many properties. So I, I would say that uh, these are, uh, these are the, the buckets, these are the instruments. It's God that thinking, thinking determinate things. And it seems to me, again, uh, if you read that according to a neoplatonic blueprint, this is the intellect processing uh, and the forms, uh, which are my buckets, are, uh, are in God's intellect. And uh, that is what a thought is, uh, determining, uh, thinking a plurality, plurality of things. That, that would be my... Okay, thank you very much, Rono. Great, great question. Uh, I have here Stefano and then Annes. Uh, ah, no, first Osvaldo Finger on, uh, on this discussion. Uh. Yes. We also have a hand by Vincenzo. Oh, uh, yeah. Ah, okay. Sorry. Would you like to go with the finger? Or? Okay. okay. No, if Vincenzo wants okay. to say something, for me, there isn't. No, I, I didn't mean to uh, deny the principle uh, of fingers trumping hands. Uh, I just wanted to put the two uh, series uh, together, so to speak. Okay. So, Vincenzo, you have a hand. Uh, yes, I, I, okay. I wanted to ask a question, but, but, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. So let's do finger first, uh, and then we will go um, to Vincenzo, who has a hand, uh, and then uh, Stefano Annes. Yes, now I will try to be very, very brief, uh, because I had the same problem uh, raised by Arnaud Pelletier in the last uh, lecture. So, what does it mean to add uh, a limit? And uh, because, of course, one would think of uh, a limitation as a subtraction and not as an addition. Uh, 
So one point is that uh, um, in one of these texts uh, in which Leibniz uh, speaks of the, um, the absolute, he, he, he resorts to his theory of conditions. So um, God is, pri is uh, natura prius, so is prior by nature, as it, and is fa facilius uh, intellecto, so it's uh, easier to understand. And in his theory of conditions, Leibniz says that what has less conditions, less requisites, is easier to understand. And then you have, if you add also negations, you add further conditions, even if they are negative one. And so in this sense, you can see that you have uh, more conditions. Uh, and so in this sense, you can understand it as an addition. But uh, apart from this, uh, uh, technical issue. Um, I think Maria Rosa is right in stressing this distinction between what is in God's essence uh, and what is in his understanding, because there is also this long debated question in uh, late scholasticism, uh, the debate about possibilia and uh, the essence of the possible. And there was this contraposition between the idea that uh, essences are in God in se ipso, so in his essence, or in se ipsis in themselves. Uh, and Leibniz seems to say that possibilia, insofar as they are possible individuals, so to say, are in, in se ipsis in the understanding of God, so are something more which is represented by God in, in the understanding, whereas what is properly in, in God's essence are only the God's attributes. So in the sense, unlimited, uh, um, not absolute, but uh, maxima, or in some sense, uh, perfections without limitations. So with this uh, usual uh, um, ecumenical or conciliatory spirit, it tries to uh, take together these two conflicting views that, uh, so the the idea that, uh, properly speaking, there are no possibilities because all, all there is are, is uh, um, God's essence, so everything is in the essence of God, and speaking of possibilia is just an improper way of speaking. This was, for instance, the idea of, of Aquinas, but he limits this just to the perfections which are in, in God's essence. On the other hand, he follows the Scottish school, so the later um, schoolmen, in saying that there is also something more. So there are uh, individual notions, uh, so possibilia in this sense, uh, which are in, in the understanding. And in this, in this sense, so uh, something more uh, is, is added. And then there is also the problem out, which is the, the big problem uh, out, if for, for Leibniz, uh, the individuals, uh, how we, we get from uh, the perfections in God to the composition of, of individuals. But that, this is another problem and a very, a very complicated one. So this is, and in some sense, if I can just take the, uh, the part of Stefano Di Bella, when coming to, to, to possible individuals, so complete, concepts in the mind of God, um, this Neoplatonic model seems to break down or at least be uh, contaminated with other, with, other, with other models because uh, the, 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 the possible Adam is, is not just a Platonic model of, of the real Adam, it's a copy. So it's, there is nothing in the real Adam which is not in the, in the possible unless existence. So in this sense, there is just a one-to-one -one correspondence. So sorry if I take too much no, time. This is great, Osvaldo. Uh, yeah, I, and it uh, seems to me that it tallies uh, beautifully with what I was uh, Time to to explain. Now you have published something uh, about that, right? Uh, I, I try to to write something in my dissertation. Okay, of course the the groundbreaking work is uh, a couple of papers by the late uh, Fabrizio Mondadori. Mm, yeah, yeah. Assesses this contraposition between uh, 
this debate between uh, schoolmen and about uh, about uh, understanding possibility possibility or essences in yeah. in sleeps or or in 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 uh, in sepsis, which was a great question in, yeah. in the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Leibniz. Uh, yeah, yeah, Leibniz clearly says in a couple of texts, uh, for instance, in his uh, discussion of Barnett, uh, the, the predestination of grace, uh, he, he clearly uh, takes the side of those of those who uh, say that um, possibilia, so in possible individuals, so to say, are in seipsis in God, so are in the understanding of God in themselves. So takes the uh, this this uh, um, position um, but the great question also among uh, I think among the schoolmen was this distinction between uh, so the, the, this kind of platonic issue of uh, archetypes or uh, uh, things which are in God's essence uh, on one end and on the other end uh, so the, the individuals yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I, I, I completely no, agree. Also because, also because uh, um, the, um, for instance, Suarez or other uh, Jesuits clearly say that God uh, has only individual ideas. So when coming to, to um, ideas, so, so to, the object, to the object of the understanding of God, there are no general ideas, properly speaking, but only individual ones. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I... I agree completely with you and Stefan on that. Uh, and in fact, when I speak of uh, a neoplatonic mold, uh, I never mean to say that there is uh, somehow a thing uh, which is orthodox and uh, neoplatonism uh, yeah. and uh, Leibniz takes it. And uh, Because uh, this neoplatonic mold uh, plays out uh, in a number of authors yeah. in completely different ways. Uh, I mean, uh, it, in a way, plays out in Spinoza, in in Leibniz, in Hegel, and okay. obviously they have, uh, uh, in many ways, uh, um, very very different uh, other commitment. And as regarding particular that, I, I completely agree that uh, a big, a huge distinction from classical Platonism there is uh, these individual essences mm. of things. There are no yeah, other. To be, to be very honest, and this is a point on which Vincenzo De Risi uh, can tell us a lot of things, uh, Plotinus is an exception among ancient philosophers and late ancient philosophers because he seems to be the only one who accepted individual uh, essences. Uh, so there is, for example, Proclus says that this is a very strange doctrine by uh, Plotinus. How do you say in English? Plotinus, Plotinus. 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 Okay. I mean, uh, like I say, it's that he, way. he seems he seems to be the only one uh, among uh, ancient and late ancient philosophers to accept the idea that there is not just the idea of man, but the idea of Socrates uh, in 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 the understanding. And then, of course, uh, this issue of the individual uh, essences we will. Uh, resurfaces all in the scholastic debates for for other reasons connected with the Christian Christian yeah. theology. Yeah, yeah. No, that is why I say that uh, in the, at least in the respects I was uh, taking this uh, is uh, a quite uh, <clears throat> remarkably Plotinus take on non, uh, on uh, neoplatonism. Of course, neoplatonism is also a very yes. broad and elastic uh, category. And also in this respect, so that, yeah, no, you are absolutely right in in uh, in uh, reminding us uh, of, of that. Okay, speaking of which, uh, Vincenzo, is that okay, Stefano? If uh, Vincenzo, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I am not sure who. who... Uh, I would have suggested it myself. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I I may connect, in fact, with uh, 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 Oswaldo mentioned of, of, of Plotinus. That is, uh, uh, even those uh, uh, ancient thinkers that admitted something like individual essences or or individual ideas uh, uh, conceived them as. Uh, um, 
constituted in any case by a finite number of predicates. Mm. What happens with Leibniz is, of course, that com complex concepts are, are are composed by by an infinite number of uh, uh, of predicates in, in in some sense. Now, uh, my question is: uh, Did you ever find any any text by Leibniz in which he doubts about the compatibility of perfections, not one by one, but uh, just for being uh, an infinite number in God. That is to say, uh, uh, I, I, I may elaborate a bit, uh, uh, one of the objections that Kant made to, to the ontological argument is, is that even though we may admit that taken in couples, so to say two by two, all perfections uh, uh, regarded uh, as positive predicates may be compatible, and Kant did not admit that, but, but I mean, for the sake of discussion, let's this, uh, 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 well, nonetheless, there could be a problem when we take an infinity of them, because at, at that point, we do not know anymore what is happening there. So uh, uh, do, you, do you think that Leibniz ever, discussed this problem that that perception per se may be compatible but but perhaps an infinity of them could not be yeah, be, be, yeah be, in, a, in a way is uh, the problem of the infinite analysis if i may uh, say so because uh, the problem with the infinite analysis is that uh, you can never go to the end uh, and uh, therefore you can never come to the proof uh, whether there is or not uh, and not a contradiction though you can uh, know only from our point of view a posteriori that uh, an individual substance is possible because uh, it exists but uh, you could not uh, do that uh, a priori because uh, precisely because there is no analysis uh, to the end of that now i have not i am not aware of texts in which leibniz uh, doubts uh, that particular thing, whether it would be a problem uh, that uh, if you have infinitely many um, uh, perfections in God, as uh, he thinks there are, at least as far as I have uh, seen, uh, that might uh, uh, constitute a problem. I uh, have the impression that it doesn't uh, um, regard that as a problem uh, because uh, once uh, you have uh, conceived them uh, as uh, purely positive, uh, each one of them uh, not including any negation whatsoever, uh, then uh, it doesn't matter if they are infinitely many. Even if they are infinitely many, uh, that will not, will not appear. That is my, my impression, but uh, I don't know if others have uh, found uh, uh, Leibniz uh, doubting or discussing that. No, no, okay. I, 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 I have not. No, that is just, uh, but it, it doesn't concern the perfections in God. When he does, is, uh, he says of calculus, uh, logical calculus, he never gives um, as an axiom uh, the associative property. So he considers just the, the sum of a couple of concepts so it, it, it treats as the basic case, the sum of a, of a couple of concepts, A and B, but he never states as an axiom the, the, um, the associative property which allows you to move from summing two elements to summing more and more. And then he uses it as a, as a without mentioning it. So perhaps uh, it was not a problem for, uh, for, for him, just to the idea that uh, you can move from a finite sum to, to uh, an infinite one, perhaps, I, I don't know. Okay. Steph, yes. do you want to come back, Steph? Um, uh, Vincenzo, or uh, no, I, 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 I can stop here. Well, thank you very much, Marius. No, but thank you, thank you for for the question, which is indeed uh, 
uh, important one. Uh, also because, I mean, nobody less than Kant uh, is raising the point. Uh, um, Stefano. Um, yes, thanks. Uh, it was very helpful um, also with regard to later German philosophy. Uh, I was um, um, struck uh, at the end by one of your um, last remarks uh, about um, how narrow uh, Leibniz's escape from pantheism, uh, pantheism uh, is. And that reminds me of um, uh, the later disputes against uh, Wolfian metaphysics, for instance, but would be interesting to pursue that as well. But now I will have um, a couple of points of clarification um, um, regarding um, um, perfection in terms of positivity, also sort of uh, uh, with regard uh, uh, to uh, later German philosophy. Um, uh, first, um, how would you say uh, that uh, uh, perfection in your interpretation relates to uh, consensus, to agreement, agreement of parts or agreement of elements, uh, which is the way later Leibnizians took, of course, uh, Wolf and even more strongly Baumgarten, for instance. And related to that, I'm, I admit, but it's maybe because I'm not that good, uh, uh, um, that expert in Leibniz as, as you all here, um, um, I'm still struggling with um, perfection in the plural, especially uh, under your interpretation. Shouldn't we rather say grades, higher or lower uh, grades of perfection? With, I would be fine with that, of course. Um, and that would seem to uh, agree to fit much better into your general neoplatonic or platonic slash neoplatonic uh, reading of uh, Leibniz and metaphysics. It might be just a, a point of, well, a very mm, narrow uh, terminological point, but still, it may be interesting, also because of later developments. And uh, third, very briefly, I, um, well, I'm, I'm kind of tempted of going back to our discussion, to your discussion about um, eminent inclusion of parts and elements uh, into the um, pure positivity of the um, hyper, hyper categorical infinite. And I'm still, uh, even, even today, um, with your um, um, clarifications about positivity and perfection and so on, I'm still seeing a very uh, well, a stronger and stronger teleological uh, background in this kind of metaphysics, which, uh, well, which actually reminds me of Cadworth. So uh, my provocative answer, uh, question would be, uh, where do you see the exact differences uh, between separating Leibniz from Cadworth, apart from vocabulary, of course? Thanks. Okay, so... Um, lots of things there. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Perfection and pure positivity, whether to think of that in terms of agreement of parts, yeah, as the later. Well, I think uh, that uh, in this, uh, um, when Leibniz is really speaking of pure positivity, parts, at least the parts formally, needs to be left out because the parts are just not good for pure positivity. So there can be a, a, a derivative uh, a sense of perfection, uh, which uh, also extend to the agreement uh, amongst parts. Uh, there, there, there is a sense in which uh, uh, something is more perfect if all the parts of the thing are there, uh, if the parts agree. Uh, but that would, in any case, not count as pure positivity. So that is one, one thing. The other thing is the perfections in the plural. Um, well, uh, I think this goes back to the classic issue of our plurality of attributes in God, plural, can be compatible with the simplicity of God which is one of the um, classic uh, um, discussion in uh, medieval scholastic philosophy 
and so on. So Leibniz does speak in the plural of perfections of God as uh, standard in the in Christian theology, people speak of uh, attributes uh, uh, of God, but there is a, a tradition in uh, um, Christian theology of uh, thinking of the plurality of the attributes of God as something really quad and nos, that is uh, something that we think of them uh, uh, as a, a plurality because uh, uh, we cannot uh, but uh, get our um, head around it by distinguishing things. But uh, they all, this all uh, stuff about eminent, uh, I think, uh, applies also to that. That uh, quad se per se, there is uh, no formal uh, plurality of perfections. Uh, because otherwise uh, you, you will uh, end up uh, with uh, these uh, determinations and negations and all that. And uh, I would uh, think of that uh, in a way which is uh, um, in agreement with this uh, uh, way of thinking of the plurality of the attributes of God. The plurality is always metaphysically uh, problematic uh, when you are trying to say that something is uh, simple, there is no negation, uh, and so on. So I would say that, uh, well, Leibniz distinguishes uh, um, perfections, he speaks of perfections in the plural and all that, but again, uh, we should have think, think of them as being with these uh, um, quad said there is a no, um, no, uh, as it were, real uh, plurality in that, in that, uh, in that sense uh, of introducing uh, a negation. I would not think of them uh, in terms of degrees of perfections, uh, because uh, in God uh, you cannot have degrees, because that uh, will, uh, to have a degree is also another way to say that there is uh, a limitation. So th that is why I don't think he, he could avail himself of that. Um, teleological background and cardboard. Uh, here I, I bounce back the question to you. Where, where do you see uh, specifically the, the, the same uh, teleology in uh, Leibniz and in uh, cardboard? Because of course cardboard in many ways was uh, uh, himself working in a Platonist. Uh, Neoplatonic. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, that is the, the what links uh, the two, uh, being uh, in a in a in a um, common framework, uh, more than a, a, a more uh, direct, as it were, uh, influence uh, uh, amongst the two. I think uh, the, the similarities come from uh, the common filiation uh, from these. Uh, a top-down explanation uh, and the, the Platonic framework, and also with this form of teleology. Okay, so um, thank you. Or uh, I, I rather not say uh, anything about Cadworth because I see um, a few questions uh, waiting for you uh, oh, there. Okay. So I don't want yeah. to. To, to... Oh, that's good. Yes, uh, there are lots of questions. Uh, okay, so I have Annes uh, here. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question on the distinction between purely creatural properties and perfections, because you made this very um, strict distinction between the two uh, creaturely properties such as round or square and divine perfections, um, which are capable of a highest degree. But I mean, if we say that God is the only fountain of essence, the only source of essence, this implies a difficulty, because that means that the purely creatural properties, such as round or square or red or bitter, can be derived from nothing else but from the divine nature. That means it must be possible to understand a creatural property, such as, I don't know, squareness, as a limitation in some way of a divine property, of like wisdom or, I don't know, power or something like that. And this seems a bit difficult to me. How can we limit wisdom or power in a way to arrive at roundness or squareness or redness or something like that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe does Leibniz have any hint of to a solution to that problematic? Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, well, no, you are right that uh, uh, th this whole picture implies that in God uh, there, there, are, there is all that is uh, positive uh, in any uh, creaturely uh, property. So how, uh, how to derive uh, some uh, specific uh, creaturely properties such as roundness of squareness uh, from uh, which specific uh, uh, property of, of God? Uh, that is uh, uh, um, a difficult uh, question, but I think Leibniz gives uh, some uh, indications uh, and uh, the Scienze Infiniti is the Scienze Infiniti is particularly uh, uh, good uh, in, in giving some hints, at least at that, uh, when he says uh, uh, from uh, imm the immensity of God, uh, we can uh, then uh, derive extension from the eternity, um, the duration, uh, and, all, uh, uh, and all that. So I think in the Scienze Infiniti, Leibniz at least uh, gives uh, a, a I wouldn't think a complete list because, of course, uh, being uh, infinite in many perfections, so we, you, you couldn't that, have that list even if we tried. Uh, but he gives uh, some uh, indications uh, of how a certain specific uh, attribute of God, a certain specific attribute of creatures uh, derive. So maybe Osvaldo has a more fresh in his mind uh, um, that uh, partial list. Uh, I, I certainly remember the immensum, the yeah. immensity of God and the eternity of God. Uh, and uh, the omniscience, uh, uh, cognition uh, comes uh, from that. Uh, and also the omnipotence uh, comes uh, the activity of creatures. Uh, so there is already uh, obviously a partial list. Uh, uh, I should think that from the immensity, you can eventually arrive to roundness and squareness. Oh, thank you. Okay, uh, I, I don't know whether if Osvaldo wants to add something to. No, that. I mean the 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 expert in this on on these questions is uh, is Richard Arthur. So <laughs> okay, should, he's not here. Because so in his uh, in his uh, forthcoming book, he has a chapter on space, uh, in which he discusses this uh, grounding, for example, the. the so the idea that this, there are these two attributes, uh, um, immensity or omnipresence uh, and um, eternity, which are uh, attributes in, in God, uh, which in some sense ground the notions of space and time uh, as they, uh, uh, which are notions related to finite, finite things. Yeah. There are no space and, and, and time in God, but there are attributes which are the I don't know the uh, the foundation, uh, um, and this is something Leibniz repeats also in other in other uh, um, yeah yeah in other Ooh. texts. And uh, of course, squareness. Uh, you have also to to think that uh, these notions are, are not simple ones. Whereas they m may be simple from our limited point of view, but they are uh, they can be analyzed for Leibniz. So with the process of analysis. At some point, you and, and the very notion of extension for Leibniz is not a simple one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so perhaps you, of course, I, I'm not saying that Leibniz uh, uh, has a procedure to derive uh, everything from uh, uh, the attributes of God, but I think that as a general suggestion in his mind, he has that. For instance, you have to 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 work with uh, uh, with simple notions, and in many cases we are not able to attain uh, simple notions because our uh, capacity of analyzing notion is 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 a limited one. Yeah, yeah, but uh, this is something that you find also in Descartes, for instance, uh, and in Malebranche. So it was a. Uh, um, yeah. Something which was also part of the conversation uh, at the time, especially in mensum uh, and space, uh, eternity and time, and, uh, and so on. Okay, uh, I am not sure whether uh, Matteo has a question. Uh, I cannot uh, read uh, 
Yes, I wrote something in the chat. I'm not at the level of the previous speakers. <laughs> oh, well, we shall see about that. Uh, I yeah, cannot read the, the chat. So if you uh, want to set it. Uh, yeah, very quickly. My question moves from the beginning of today's speech when you presented the logical explanation of the existence of God in Leibniz. Uh, and we say that privation of reality the concept of limit and necessarily belongs to creation in the sense that it is logically impossible for a created things to be unlimited. And we say also that only that whose existence is absolutely necessary and therefore depends on nothing other than itself as infinite perfection, and that is God. Here is my question. How can we make compatible compatible this limit with the logical explanation of the existence of God. If I consider that also the, I, I wrote a mind the logical framework is a, a ex nihilo creation of God, I can only see two potential critical consequences. The first one is that mind logical framework exists before God, but in this case we will talk of ex nihilo nihilo fit, of uncreated things, which is not the case in Leibniz, we say it. The second potential critical consequence, is, uh, in my opinion, is that uh, just by means of a series of logical processes, which are limited, as we say, because portion of the creation, we can reach the demonstration of the pure perfection of God. How can something limited explain the pure perfection? In other words, if the process from God to reality works by adding limits to single things, we say, the other way around seems not working like the theory of creation. This is my, uh, my question, I don't know if it was clear. And uh, every time I, I, I see the logic explanation of God, when we want to say that God, uh, Ex, ex nihilo, I can see the compatibility, the compatibility. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, uh, um, thank you very much. I would say that uh, uh, for Leibniz, uh, God that uh, is not uh, ex nihilo um, in, the, in any sense. So I, I don't quite recognize that uh, the, the problem, the starting point problem as uh, uh, having to explain uh, the creation of God uh, ex nihilo, because uh, that uh, strictly applies only to things uh, which uh, are not God. Um, Leibniz goes along uh, with uh, the idea that uh, God uh, is eternal, uh, is certainly not created, uh, is certainly not uh, ex nihilo, and uh, the way in which he explains uh, God's existence, uh, and I would like to say he gives a reason, uh, but never a cause, uh, of God's existence uh, is uh, with uh, that uh, um, understanding of uh, the claim to existence, uh, which is proportional uh, to the degree of perfe perfection. If you conceive God uh, as uh, the ens perfectissimum, then it follows uh, that uh, nothing could have uh, a, a greater claim to existence, and uh, for uh, this is the reason uh, why uh, God exists. But uh, it is not a creation ex nihilo, and uh, therefore I think uh, when it comes to God, the Leibniz doesn't go uh, there at all. As regarding trying to find uh, the other way around, uh, that is, uh, I said that there is uh, this uh, top-down explanation, uh, the imperfect is explained by the perfect, uh, and I would, uh, I would say that uh, for Leibniz uh, simply is not the case uh, that the imperfect uh, needs to be, no, that the imperfect needs to explain the perfect. The, the order of explanation is, is top down. That is why you couldn't find the other way around, because for Leibniz, at least as far as I understand, there is not. So the, the, the imperfect does not explain the perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for all these questions. We have uh, reached uh, and indeed uh, even uh, breached our limit uh, is uh, 12 or 4 in Milan and uh, uh, everybody I'm sure wants to get some lunch especially if you are uh, uh, minded to come back uh, at 1.30 in Milan for uh, the last talk uh, which will be 
uh, outside uh, this series on uh, Leibniz, uh, God, uh, creatures, and Neoplatonism, but, but still uh, we'll do on some of this material uh, to uh, make uh, some methodological uh, uh, claims uh, and uh, remarks. So, uh, well, I say thank you to you all for coming uh, so faithfully uh, over these uh, three days, uh, and uh, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to revisit this uh, set of papers, uh, which uh, ended up uh, being uh, uh, at least uh, for me a, a coherent uh, uh, set of uh, explorations of these aspects in Leibniz metaphysics. Uh, and I am, uh, uh, somewhat to my surprise, uh, not yet finished uh, Leibniz. Uh, it's like a black hole. Uh, when you come uh, nearby, it sucks you in, and then uh, it's difficult to, to, to get out. Uh, so I am not yet finished because uh, I am working on a paper on Leibniz and monism, uh, thanks to um, Richard and uh, um, Osvaldo's uh, um, wonderful edition of De Scienzia Infiniti. So still a work in progress. Uh, and uh, therefore, very helpful for me to have uh, your uh, your reaction, your feedback uh, on these uh, on these issues. We, we, we okay. Thank you very so, much. We thank you very much for the three uh, live talks, and we see you uh, in 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 a moment, actually, for the fourth one. So thanks again. Bye bye. And thank you, Dana, and uh, Arno for joining uh, from uh, other parts of the world. Uh, and also those of who are not physically in Milan. Thank you, Maria Rosa. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.